Hugh Bonneville, welcome to the Globe. Oh, okay. isn't this just heaven? Beautiful. Does it? I, I have to. I feel we need a line of Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> Something looking over. Oh, Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou, no, Romeo? <laughs> you, you. I mean, you've become globally famous. There isn't, you know, kind of a household in America that doesn't know you, of course, for Downton Abbey, um, you, Notting Hill, for television and cinema. But you started out in theatre. Do you do you miss it? Would you like to go back? Yes, absolutely. Um, when you kind of potter around backstage, are you getting that little pitter patter of? I know, definitely, definitely. The um, uh, you know the roar of the grease paint, the smell of the crowd. <laughs> uh, no, I love it. It's my. It's, it's it sounds a cliche, but it is my home. It's where I started, and it's all I ever wanted to do was be in theatre. I never thought I'd be on the screen. I thought, in my sort of weird uh, teenage, early twenties brain that screen acting was um, something that was over there and that's what Americans did brilliantly and uh, theatre was a sort of British you know, um, uh, tradition and that's where I felt at home. So I feel very, I, I love being on stage, I love being in a live environment. I haven't been on stage actually for a couple of years now, for five years probably. Um, but I'm looking forward to going back and doing some more because, because it is, it's live. And you have a control over the performance, which you don't on screen. It's true, that, th that thing people always say about how you feel the audience when you're on stage, like you can feel whether they're they're paying attention or slightly looking at their watches thinking am I going to make the last train home yeah you can totally I did it the last play I did was a, a beautiful play by Bill Nicholson called Shadowlands which uh, is a movie with uh, Deborah Winger and uh, Tony Hopkins mm -hmm. <clears throat> about C.S. Lewis and his late flowering love and it's shot through with great wit and humor about this very closed off man who finds love late in life and then she dies and it's really a story about the question that he asks at the beginning of the play is if God is love or is all, you know, why does he allow suffering? And, and C.S. Lewis has to come to terms with that. And the final scene when C.S. Lewis finally breaks down in front of um, his late wife's son um, is, is very, very, very moving. And I have to say that <clears throat> The, the, the sight, there's a quality of silence when you get it right. And to, and to hear whatever, 800, 1,000 people just going completely quiet as this man goes through what he's going through. It's very special, it's very special as is a huge woofer of a laugh, you know. And you can't get that. I mean, you can get it in a movie theatre if you, if you all go. Please, you know, never stop going to movie theatres. But we do become, you know, we have become, particularly you know, since the pandemic, and we all bought bigger TVs and we sit at home with our popcorn. We think, why would we go out and right. share an experience? But there is a hunger for the live experience and long may it last. Could we see you in Shakespeare again? Oh, I'd love to, yeah. I don't know what, but... Um... Any roles you'd love to play? Well, I think it's time for my Romeo, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I hate to say this, Hugh, you know, maybe a little little old for Romeo? I mean, I, <laughs> well, listen, Ian McKellen I, I played Hamlet. I don't want to be your director saying, <laughs> God forbid, I'm sure the makeup artist could do a great job. Well, I think if Ian McKellen can play Hamlet at uh, 83, then... You uh, could damn well I play Romeo. I could damn well play Romeo. <laughs> Might need a, sort of, you know, a truss or something. But <laughs> OK, I think we should go downstairs. But wait, can we do it? Can you manage this? <laughs> OK. Romeo and Juliet, the balcony scene, for one night and one night only, <laughs> brought to you by Hugh Bonneville and Catty Kay. Oh, gosh. I haven't done this for, I don't know, how many years? <laughs> this I think is I, your challenge. 1982, I think I did this. But soft, what light through yonder window breaks. It is the east and Juliet is the sun. Arise, fair sun, and kill the envious moon, who is already sick and pale with grief, that thou, her maid, art far more fair than she. Be not her maid, since she is envious. That's all you're getting. <laughs> I mean, that's all I have to say. <laughs> she oh. speaks, she speaks, but not to me. Okay, I think, applause. I think we've got, I think we we've nailed got, it. We've got the one role. One take and we've one got the take part. only. You grew up quite shy as a child. <laughs> Acting doesn't seem like the obvious career. I know a lot of people who are sort of shy or introverted in some ways and find a release on stage or in character. I think that's certainly a characteristic of mine. I was the youngest of three. My sister was six years older, so 
I wasn't uh, alone. Or I mean, I'm sorry, I wasn't lonely, but I was alone because they were you know, they were at boarding school. So I did have to make my own entertainment. Really, um, I didn't have them, you know, chasing me around the garden and pinching me. Um, so the dressing up box became my friend and uh, and the world of the imagination. And you had a lodger who was an actor. Well, that's right. That yeah, you? definitely. There was an actor called Michael Bates. Um, who my parents had known just from as a neighbour when they used to live in South West London, and we were living South East London now, and the Greenwich Theatre was our local theatre. And um, Michael came to lodge for a few nights or a week or so while they were getting the play up and running. And uh, I just thought he was the bloke who you know, had a boiled egg at breakfast. And, um, and then one night my dad said, uh, should we go and pick Michael up from the theatre? Um, and I was very excited because it meant staying up past my bedtime. I was probably seven or eight. And, um, and I can remember going to the Greenwich Theatre and creeping into the back of the stalls and there was our lodger on stage and it was a play called Forget Me Not Lane by uh, Joan, uh, Peter Nichols. And, um, and it was the final scene and I can't remember whether it was a funny scene or a pin drop silent scene, but whatever. He and his colleagues were telling this story in the dark and had 300, 400 people in the palm of their hands, and I was absolutely captivated. The next morning, I just stared at him at breakfast. I was completely mesmerized. Forget the egg and the, and the, and, he and the, the toast. He was the god. He was a god. Yeah, he was god who ate an egg. And I looked at him in a completely different way, that, that he and his colleagues had had this you know, extraordinary impact on a, on a shared experience in a, in a room like this. You know? And that really, I, I can remember it vividly, so that was a, a, a proper influence. The characters that you've played um, and that you've particularly become well known for in America. I guess it was, I mean, it was Downton Abbey, so let's talk about that, that mm. kind of catapulted you. I, I and some friends spent every Sunday night for about four series of Downton Abbey having dinner together, watching, and our mm. kids, there were sort of six kids, and we would go from house to house. We always liked <laughs> it when we went to our Italian friends, the food was better. And we would sit and watch Downton Abbey, and almost everyone I knew was having a similar experience. <laughs> and I remember the first time I met you, was at the State Department. I went to him and said, Hugh, do you realise how big it is here? It was just when it was exploding. He said, I don't know why, it's just a posh soap. <laughs> <laughs> Which it is. Um, and I mean that as a compliment to it. Um, Julian Fellows uh, was a big fan of Coronation Street, which is you know, one of the longest running soaps uh, in the world, I think. Um, hugely popular still in Britain. And he was a big fan of the West Wing and uh, scenes that, or, or rather shows that have tremendous pace to them. And, uh, and short scenes often, usually. Um, and that was one of the characteristics of Downton, that it had this, this sort of breakneck pace to it, or rather, if you got bored of one character, there was another one coming along in about 25 seconds. So it did have that soap element. And certainly for most of the, of the show, you could say that it was about, for example, you know, tension, not violence, romance, not sex. You could sit down with your granny, you know, and with your grandchild and watch it. And, and that sense of um, crossing the generations was something that really, I think, uh, took, you know, why the show took off, that it was, uh, became a family experience, as you say. The other movie, I guess, that I knew you for first and that I think Americans did as well was Notting Hill. Talking of rather bumbling <laughs> uh, British characters, but I have to say, I love Bernie. <laughs> and for me, he stole the movie. I mean, Julia Roberts and Hugh Grant, but it was, there was, you had those short scenes um, where you, you took the film away. Was that <laughs> film for you a kind of breakout moment as well? We talked about Downton Abbey, but I imagine yeah. that Notting Hill and what you did with that role. Notting Hill was a, a, a wonderful experience, I have to say. It was my first sort of decent part in a film. It was, all of us had much bigger parts and they ended up on the cutting room floor um, in order to put the money on the screen, Hugh and Julia, understandably. But uh, we had a beautiful, it was a beautifully written script and really fun to do and with nice people and we had a laugh. Um, and I was in, a, in a, you know, a, a big budget movie for the first time and so what's not to like? I, I learned a lot on that film, for instance, you know, if you're going to do a dining room scene, um, be careful what you eat on the wide shot because you've got to eat it on every other angle. <laughs> and we're doing, with, you know, as you may recall, there's a, uh, who's going to eat the brown, the last brownie. And um, oh, at the end of the dinner party. At the end of the yes, dinner party, right, there's, there's a whole there. brownie sequence, and I, like a mug, at 8 a.m. ate two brownies on the wide shot, and um, and so there every there about eight other angles, you know, that day, and I ended up having to eat these bloody brownies. And I swear to God, I went out for dinner that night at a friend's house and they served brownies and I sort of virtually threw up. 
Um, uh, so I learned I learned that trick of the trade. Don't eat unless you have to. <laughs> what was it like working with a kind of real celeb? The first time you, I mean, Julia Roberts was mega. Mm. Uh, still is mega, but was mega when you worked with her. Yeah, yeah. Was that it was kind of daunting, scary? Did you have normal human reactions? Or well, it's quite funny because these are the days when, when whatever, yeah. a celeb. Well, I can remember we, we, rehe we were rehearsing in this freezing cold church hall in Notting Hill, literally with a sort of gas heater here, and we were all huddled round. And you know, it's the days when you know, there was a lot more smoking going on. So we'd all be puffing away, and Roger Michel, the director, and, uh, uh, you know, with, with, with uh, ashtrays. This was before Julia arrived. Uh, so we had two or three days, I think, before she arrived. And then literally on the day she arrived, everyone stopped smoking. Suddenly there was no... <laughs> and she came in. I remember her coming in and saying, you know, hi. And she was wearing, you know, jeans and a T-shirt. Oh, a, a, she's stunning. You know, of course, she's got this amazing radiance about her. But also, she's just completely normal. She's one of us. And the first thing she said was, anyone have a cigarette? <laughs> so out came five packets of silk cut. Um, uh, so, well, that's sort of what the film's about, isn't it, really, in a way, Notting Hill. It's about that notion of, you know, normality and celebrity. Yeah. And, and, the, and the, the trappings that come with it, good and bad, to do with being in the public eye. Um, you know, it's a, it's a tricky one. And, and you've now been in the public eye. I mean, it must be, a, that was kind of like, like you say about the trappings of, do you have moments where you think, oh God, I just want to be anonymous and yeah, it's I do, hard for I do. you to walk around. Yeah, all, all I ever wanted was to be, frankly, all I ever wanted was to be on stage. I, I never thought I'd be on telly or indeed in a, a film or, or, or be in the public eye in that way. Um, <clears throat> so it's, it's a strange, it is a strange thing. Um, it's a strange thing when you're in a restaurant and, you know, you're aware that someone's taking pictures of you and you think, well, you know, can I just finish my meal? And, you know, um, uh, people always say, um, I'm sorry, I don't normally do this. You think, well, there's two lies straight away. <laughs> you're not sorry and you do do this and I am in the middle of a meal and can I, you know, can I just finish my meal and then we'll have a picture outside or something like that. So I think the world of the, of the camera phone and all that is, has changed things a lot. Have you ever thought of playing an American? <laughs> can I hear you? No. Go on. No, I'm too self-conscious now. Please, I've got please, proper... I've got, he can please. do it. <laughs> I, no, I can't. I, no, I can't. I, I bet you can. No, I can with a bit of study, but I'm, no, I'm, I'm too self-conscious now. Um, but we did do once on... Um, I think it was Stephen Colbert we were doing... Uh, three of us went on... Three, three of us from Danton went on, and he gave us the script, and we had to do it and do the characters in American accents, which was quite funny. So reading Robert as an American. Actually, I can't... Yeah, I can't do it. My kids do in, uh, both British and American. Mm. And when they're with their American friends, they only speak American, and when they're with us, they speak British. And they can't switch. So if they were with us, they couldn't speak American. That's interesting. That's very They don't know how to... It, yeah, yeah. It, it's a language that belongs, it's an accent that belongs to certain circumstances in their life. So I can see why you can't suddenly turn it on. No, I should be able to. Even though you did a very good Romeo. <laughs> no, I'm not falling for it. I'm not gonna it. <laughs> Re Romeo in American? <laughs> yeah. Good stuff. Fly through yonder window breaks. <laughs> he did it. <laughs> a bit like some of your characters, and I'm thinking, I guess, of Bernie, particularly in Notting Hill, you're one of the most self deprecating people I know. <laughs> in real life and on, on screen, but so I'm sort of almost not sure if I can ask this question, but what is it that makes you such a good actor? Uh, I'm a good listener. Acting is about listening, I think. Um, and there's a Michael Caine story and he, he does it. He did, there's a lovely thing on YouTube, which, you, which I recommend to every young actor to watch. It's a, a masterclass he did probably 30 years ago now. And in it, he talks about when he was on stage at the Royal Court Theatre in London, you know, in his early career. And, um, and he had, you know, no lines or whatever. Uh, he was, I think he was playing a policeman or something standing at the back of the stage while the interview took place with the, you know, the copper and the, and the, and the bad guy. And the, at one point, the director said to him during rehearsals, he said, what are, you, what are you doing, Michael? He said, well, I'm not doing anything. I've got anything to say. And he said, no, you've got loads to say. You've got the world of stuff you could talk about, but you choose not to. So that, that in, I, in other words, keep it alive, you know, keep the thoughts alive, even if you have got a you know, smallish part. And actually Julian Fellows brought that up at the read through of the very first episode of Downton Abbey. He said, go and watch Gosford Park and look at Sophie Thompson. She hasn't got a lot of lines, but she's absolutely present in every single scene. And you, and you, and you absolutely are inside the head of that character. Uh, which was a very good note. So it's about being present. It's mm. about being, and, and as I say, listening and reacting. Um, it's not just about how many lines you've got. 
Is it that what you wanted from it when you were a child and you went and saw that lodger? Is it what you've got from it? That that sense yeah, of being I able to captivate an yeah, audience. Yeah, I think um, I think probably the happiest four days in my career were when at the Royal Shakespeare Company, the four plays that we'd rehearsed over the period of several months finally came on stream together. And that thrill of being with the same company of people, pretty much the same company, with a different audience every day, with a different wonderful play, that was thrilling. And I loved that. So that, that element of uh, doing what I used to do, you know, as a, as a kid with the dressing up box, doing it and being paid for it, um, is a wonderful feeling. We had something to show you. This is a kind of little, this is your life, Hugh Bonneville moment. Oh my gosh, what? Ah! <laughs> okay, so that is my very first professional job. Uh, that's, uh, we'd, um, I had understudied Rafe Fiennes as Lysander in A Midsummer Night's Dream. Then we went on tour around Europe and I got promoted to play Lysander because <laughs> he was playing Oberon. And so this is my Hermia. Beverly Hills was her name. She changed her name from Beverly Williams to Beverly Hills. And, um, uh, and Carolyn Backhouse, and this is an actor called Actually, Ben Cole. you changed your name from Williams. I did, you're quite right, yeah, but to not Bonneville. to Hills. But not Hills, <laughs> well, not no. Not Beverly Hills. No. Um, yeah, no, because Maybe I... that was aspirations. <laughs> um, so that was in, actually, that's taken in Munich. Um, we were doing publicity for the show as we took it on tour around Europe. And uh, yes, I've looked like I've got really funny big pants you, on <laughs> you you have got funny big pants on but it is still very recognizably you um this one i love <laughs> well yes you were talking earlier about um the impact of uh, of, yeah. of our show this is i think about season four or five and when the show had become hugely popular and you can see there's a couple of paparazzi but lenses Quite a lot there. of paparazzi yeah. and that's what i love it looks like you're sort of Hiding. I am. You are hiding. <laughs> Literally hiding. And I love that picture because they don't know I'm there. Yeah. <laughs> so I am, we were about to do a scene over in the village shop or at the church or whatever it was. And yeah, we, by then we had to have security and stuff because, you know, people wanted to come and see what we were up to and the paps wanted uh, long lens pictures. So just to be able to stand just behind a wall knowing that all that was going on. Yeah. It's the knowing <laughs> smile that you know you're hiding and they don't know you're there. That's what yeah, I like yeah. about that. Okay. And this is now your life, of course, oh. where you just hang out with Matt Damon and George Clooney. And oh, yeah. well, he was, I have to say, the most uh, generous of directors and company leaders, a true gent. And um, I couldn't believe it. My first day's filming on The Monuments Men um, was with the lovely Bob Balaban, and John Goodman, Matt Damon, Jean Dujardin, and... Um, uh, and then and we say, okay, we've got Paddington here. So this, the reason for this is that when we finished Paddington 1, there was a, um, a, an edict went out from Studio Canal, the producer saying, we'd love to see where Paddington goes this year. Will you, will you send in photographs so we can keep the, keep the bear alive, as it were, while we're editing? And so I took Paddington everywhere with me and I had him, you know, um, I took him on chat shows and, you know, they always cut it out. But um, I took Paddington. So I said to the Monument Men guys, you know, can I have a picture with you know, Paddington? So I, I used to, wherever I was in the world, I'd send pictures of Paddington back to Studio Canal. So they were rather pleased with that one. Yeah, I bet they liked that. <laughs> um, this is a lovely photo. Oh, you got me. You got me. Mm. <laughs> it's my darling dad. <clears throat> um, yeah, that's my darling dad who passed away just before the pandemic uh, hit. Um, we were able to give him a proper send off in a church, unlike so many thousands of people who couldn't say goodbye to their beloved ones. Um, he was 94, so he'd had an amazing innings and, uh, and uh, dementia was the journey that he went on. Um, he was a surgeon. A urologist, right? He was a, a urologist. Surgeon, yeah, waterworks. Yeah. He, um, in those, back in the day, there were three urology hospitals in London, St. Peter's, St. Paul's and St. Philip's, known as the Pissing Apostles. And, uh, and he used to cycle around town to see his patients. Uh, and he was a wonderful pianist, and, uh, as well as a, a skilled surgeon with his hands. So that was, and it was the, his ability to play music was with him to the very, or nearly the end. Your dad thought you were going to be a lawyer. Yeah, yeah. What I, did he uh, think of, you know... You're making a full-time career of acting. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, um, he was you know, incredibly supportive, as was my mum. But I think it was a world he found a little strange. Uh, but they were, they were very good at bigging up 
behind one's back. I remember, my, as I say, my very first job was at Regent's Park at the Open Air Theatre in Midsummer Night's Dream. I had one line in Romeo and Juliet as well, with Rafe Fiennes playing Romeo. And I bumped into my godfather one afternoon. He said, I gather you're playing Romeo at Regent's Park. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, I know where that God story's parents, come from. Right? I know, I know. So yeah, no, he was, uh, they were incredibly supportive. Didn't, he, he thought that TV and film was a bit odd. Theatre was all right, though. Theatre was legitimate. Was, but you, they'd always had, you'd had art. I mean, your dad played the piano. And you talk about how you, you felt lucky to have always had art, even in a sort of light touch way. Yeah. The arts. Absolutely. In I, your life growing up. And they gave you that. They did. Um, and I'm immensely grateful to them because... You know, that there was a sort of background white noise of culture with a small C. They weren't highfalutin. They just, we just went to every blooming country house and every museum and every art gallery. And I was so bored. And you grumbled. And I grumbled. All I wanted to do was get to the gift shop and buy a key ring. You know, that was the important thing. Um, and I am so grateful to them because, I, as I say, I, I grew up with this taking for granted that this cultural background was everyone's. But it's not. I realised how privileged I was, and particularly when I got into my teens and joined the National Youth Theatre and, and realised and, and met, started to meet kids from all over the country from different backgrounds to mine. And I realised how damn lucky I was to have been taken to the theatre, to concerts, to art galleries. Um, and, and, uh, and so that's why I'm, I'm passionate now about things like the National Youth Theatre and, and other arts organisations that allow a bigger outreach for, for young people because... Um, you know, it's what makes us human, the, the, the notion of culture, whatever, in whatever form, <clears throat> um, to, to use the imagination, to explore the imagination and, and the intellect, to try and understand each other as human beings. God knows we need understanding and, um, and not everyone has access to it and I, I, I'm, I'm passionate about enabling access. Like that. Yeah. Uh, Hugh, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, thank Cathy. You. I've enjoyed it. I really enjoy being in this theatre as well. Yeah, what a treat. How lucky are we? <laughs>